Hello, everybody. So, so Mark Rifkin is going to have his presentation on Amiga music and other little things. So, take it away, Mark. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to class. <laughs> so, I'm going to talk about Amiga music applications and how it works, how people compose and put together songs, and how the programs evolved over the years too. Kind of did a little research on the different apps. I did a little bit of everything back in the day. You know, I wasn't a musician or an artist. I just did art and music on my own. Um, so I kind of went back and saw like, what programs did we use? And where did they come from? <laughs> so I have a little bit of a presentation and a little bit of demo. I have my 1200 here, just a different color keyboard in case, but it's still a 1200 inside. Um, my original Yamaha keyboard uh -huh. from 1980. Five, maybe. <laughs> Still works. And they're connected with a MIDI connector here, the ECE MIDI, one of many that came out in those days. And it just basically converts from the serial port to MIDI, which is the serial port of music. You know, basically how music instruments talk to each other, whether they're keyboards, drum machines, all that kind of stuff. Um, so let me, let's get into our presentation. So uh, first, All right, so first is um, Deluxe Music Construction Set. So when the Amiga was first released, there were apps that came out that um, they wanted to promote and support the Amiga platform. Electronic Arts was one of those, those um, initial companies that really came out with a whole library of games. And uh, um, They had a library of games and applications. I mean, Deluxe Paint was like a big thing. And they had all these uh, construction sets. There was like Deluxe Music Construction Set, Deluxe Video Construction Set. They eventually ported it to other platforms. Um, but DMCS, or Deluxe Music Construction Set, was one of the first music apps on the scene. Um, you know, very early in its day. Uh, let's see, I have a screenshot here. There's the packaging. Um, there's a screenshot. They had a piano keyboard. I'll bring it up on here in a second. Musical notation, that was one of its big selling points, that it, it used full musical notation graphically that you could transcribe from sheet music to there or vice versa to uh, you know, to work like a musician would work and not have to think as a computer person. Um, it supported both the Amiga sounds and MIDI. I mean, at, at that hmm. time, a lot of the ones used the Amiga sounds because they wanted to be more affordable and accessible to everybody, not just anyone who had an expensive synthesizer. But um, as you'll see, the synthesizers of the day sounded a lot better than computers, at least initially. Mm. Um, not only was um, Electronic Arts committed to, to Commodore, Commodore used Deluxe Music in its advertising. So like an Amiga ad, they used the had BB King using, his, uh, using the Deluxe Music to put together songs and compose things. So they definitely uh, took advantage of, of the popularity of Computers and technology, and music. I think that's all I have in the present. Oh yeah, so as you can see, this is a. I'll bring it up on here too. It's a 1.3 UI app, which you know, the Amiga DOS 1.3, which came out earlier. Um, eventually, they did upgrade to the 2.0 look, hmm. Deluxe Music 2. They took out the construction set part. And one thing I discovered along the way is that uh, the developer of Music X was one of the developers who made that happen. Oh. He helped write the code that made the um, UI easy to translate into the 2.0 look and feel. We'll talk about Music X as well. So let me uh, bring up a song here. Score. Octacata. Let's give it a whirl here. This is all coming out of the Amiga right now. I'll wait till it gets a few more notes. All right, so you get the idea that it, it still sounds very computer-like. Um, you can play down here. And I think keys. So you can hear what it sounds like. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this top 
stanza here and change its instrument mm. from the built-in sound to MIDI. So first I have to turn MIDI on, and then I go to MIDI channel, and I pick MIDI channel one. So MIDI has channels. The thing about MIDI is that it's basically telling what to play and how to play it, but not how it should sound. So the, the instruments are totally built into the device playing the sound. So it's telling it to play you know, a C or F key, but then the, the synthesizer, however good, or the Amiga, however good, whatever instrument it's using, that's what it sounds like. So I'm going to set this to MIDI channel 1, because you can have up to 16 channels. Now you hear the keyboard playing. It's just going through the serial port to the back here. So now when I hit play, oh wait, I didn't assign it. Hold on. Stop. i got to go over here to, probably a quick accordion. I forget which one you there. Oh wait, yeah, here's what I do. I, I go to accordion. Yeah, I'm trying to remember how I did this. It's under measure, set instrument. There we go. Oh. Uh -huh. Should bring up a window. But he's not doing that. Alright. I did this once before. We can edit that part out. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mark, you're, changing tra you're trying to change instruments right now? Yeah. Oh, okay. That's what I'd like to know. I mean, I've played a, a little bit with uh, the construction set, the Lux Music construction set, but there. I don't know. I got it. <laughs> I don't know how to change instruments on the thing. It's all in the order. So, what I had to do okay. is um, make sure the cursor is in this uh, stanza here. Okay. And. Then I went to um, set instrument, and it changed it to my current instrument, which is the MIDI channel one. I had to set the set to, set it to MIDI channel one, and then assign it to there. So now oh. instead of saying accordion, it says MIDI channel one up here. Oh, okay. So now when I hit play, so now that it's playing, I could like flip it around here. Ooh. So whatever instrument I set on there. learning is that each of these programs is a completely different way of doing the same thing. So your software is driving your keyboard. Yeah. But it, it basically it's only telling it, you know, what notes to play, how to play them, but the instruments are set on the keyboard. Uh, if you don't the have... Key, the keyboard, by the way, can do, you know, way more notes at the same time. The Amiga had four voices. Mm. These, well, these keyboards had eight or 16 voices mm. that could play at the same time. If you don't have a, a MIDI keyboard connected to your Amiga, how do you, is the process for changing instruments the same method? Yeah, yeah. instead of, when you go to sounds here, there's, the, these are the sounds, accordion, holosynth, and electric bass. Those are the ones that are currently loaded for this song. Uh -huh. And then down here is a load instrument button. Oh, that you load, can load the instrument. In. Yeah, so you're just uh -huh. loading other IFF sound files okay. to be more instruments to choose from. Mm. Did they always have this? Is this a, an original feature? The export to MIDI, output to MIDI, serial? Yeah, I mean, a, a, almost every program that I've looked at has some sort of MIDI support. Yeah. Um, I never noticed it. I, mean, I, I used Flux Music Instruction Set a long time ago, and I never even bothered to, have, to look at the MIDI setup. Uh, let me switch over to the newer version. This is where it might crash. Let's see, it quits. Yeah, see, it's going to crash. I'm going to reboot. Uh -huh. Luckily, it reboots pretty quick. All right, let's go back here. And let's go to the last music. So there we go, the last music. Load up our uh, song.
Now, the instrument names are the same here, but they changed the sound samples that are bundled with it. Huh. So when I hit play, it sounds a little different. Uh huh. Still sounds like a computer. And, but the, the way you set it up is a little different too. So if I go back up here, um, where's my, I will get back to the beginning. There. So now if I click on the arrow, I think I can highlight the word accordion right there. So you can change the instruments that way. And then similar thing where I go to settings. Um, okay, I have to go here to MIDI setup and make MIDI. MIDI's off by default because they assume you're not connected to a keyboard, so they don't want to be outputting stuff out your serial port in case you have a modem or something, I guess. <laughs> so you have to turn MIDI on, and uh, that's good. And then I go to um, choose instruments. Set instrument. And now here are the instruments. So this is, a, this is the window I was looking for on the other one. The, other one. the original one didn't have this window. So I'm going to go to where accordion is set up. And instead of playing it through a sample that it has in, in the computer, I'm going to tell it to go out to MIDI instead. Okay. And uh, I'm just going to turn the sample side off. So even though it still says accordion, it should oh. play through there. So play and back out. Back out the MIDI again. So the nice thing about that is that you could theoretically, you know, create music without the keyboard because you know if you're a music studio, keyboards were pretty expensive in the day. You could still create them and test do your musical notation on your Amigas, and then when you're ready to do a performance or a recording, you could hook up to your keyboard and play it there. Can you go the other way around? Yes, um, they do support input, so you can mm. put it into record mode mm. and then play on the keyboard, and it will record all the notes that you play. Very nice. Cool. I'm going to ask the. Um, uh, I think that I was a fan of the uh, keyboard. I had a have an old uh, Ansonic VFX from the early. Actually, that's a vintage keyboard. Yeah. It'd be nice to connect that to a vintage computer, I guess. But the um, I remember being able to uh, save the the type of instrument. And then, uh, so you could have a, a piece with multiple instruments playing, and then send that to the MIDI keyboard, and it would play multiple instruments. But you'd have to line up the, you know, the uh, the, the particular instruments with that ID or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the the perfect, this is not like this is like a consumer prosumer keyboard. It has the instruments are hard coded into it. But the professional ones had memory storage, and you some yeah. had like a floppy drive. Right. Or a, you can right. Do, so you would download musical instruments into its memory, and that, that way you could keep changing what, what kind of style of music you want to play. But I mean, with this one, could you have, uh, well, does the software support them sending multiple uh, Not, different uh, well, instruments to the MIDI? That's you might something. have to use a different program. Like, well, there are programs that do it. I'm going to get to other ones oh. that, that might have that. The so, music, I don't think, This is send. like your basic, very yeah. introductory it, kind it, of it, it, what, what Jim is saying is, is, like on the more professional keyboards that allow, like, a disk drive in them. Can you load a disk drive, I mean a disk, into your MIDI keyboard and then have have that be dumped into the Amiga? Oh, that way? Yeah, that you way. Get no, the, I'm it, not asking that well, way. Well, okay, well, the, 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 that's the brand new question then. <laughs> I don't know. Um, oh. And again, like, this program doesn't support, I don't think it supports the transfer of instrument files. Mm, there are probably okay. are programs that will do that. Oh. It is possible. Yeah, but but, but each of those the keyboards, the, the way they stored those files is proprietary. MIDI is a standard, but it's only the notes and how they're played. Like it, with MIDI, oh, okay. it'll tell you like what note on the scale you're playing, how hard it was it should be playing. But the actual sound file, that, the sample that it's playing, is usually proprietary to the Sonic, Yamaha, Roland. You know those guys on their own. Right, but there was. I, this is a, an old memory, but I remember there being from the, you know, I had it connected to a PC, and you could, uh, you could essentially, each note could be a, or assigned a code for which instrument, just a number. Yeah, yeah, you And then you it could would send yeah. a number along with the, the note and the, and the uh, length of the note and all that, and then the keyboard would go, oh, he wants piano now, and oh, he wants organ now. Yeah, yeah, yeah there, there's like a, a patch system where you, you identify which sounds, you, you give them like an ID code. So that you right. can tell it what That's to play. Right. Yeah. So that could that could go down uh, along the serial interface, along with the note. 
Yeah. So you could even from a, this computer you could play multi a multi voice thing with your keyboard. Probably. Yeah. All right, so that's deluxe music. Um, let me move on to another tool here that I, that I used a little bit more, Sonics. Mm. So what I learned about Sonics is um, Aegis was based in Santa Monica, so a local company, so to speak. Um, Sonics was based off of a program called MusicCraft. So when the Amigo 1000 launched, there was GraphicCraft, MusicCraft, oh. word processor, TextCraft. Um, they were all commissioned to be developed so that they could say, yes, we have a word processor. <laughs> we have a music program. Um, and uh, Aegis inherited MusicCraft and turned it into Sonics. And they had a 1.0 and a 2.0. Um, and Sonics kind of, I feel like, is like, it's halfway from, like, Deluxe Music feels like it was made for Amiga Music first and then they added MIDI. Whereas Sonics is about half and half. So you can do both equally. Um, in, in a similar way, just different buttons, different names on the buttons. Um, one neat thing about Sonics, I'm gonna get there, it has notation, although the notation, I don't know if this is like something that changed if you run Sonics on a newer Amiga OS, but it doesn't show you the progress where you are in the song when you hmm. play. Um, there is a like a bar to go on when There is, play, yeah. I don't see. <laughs> but, um, and Sonics is definitely tied to the, um, Four voices of the Amiga, mm. one, two, three, four. Um, it has uh, three screens: it's got the, the, the note composition, there's a waveform, and then there's uh, another one, um, the instrument. But uh, well, we'll get to that. So in the uh, waveform, though, you can create sounds very similar to the way the SID chip created sounds back in the day. So you've got your waveform here. So mm. instead of only being lit, like the SID chip had, but sawtooth, square, um, sine, and one more. <laughs> Noise? Noise? But it had built in waveforms. Here you can just draw a waveform. You can make one. And then you can do the ADSR, you know, there's the amplitude, there's the envelope generator here. So instead of uh, ADSR was like attack to case, the same release. It was the how the sound volume level changes when you press a note. Whereas this envelope here has um, oh, levels and rates. So it's got the four of each. You know, how speed and intensity and uh, Love, uh, uh, hot, you know, intensity, how loud it is. So you could basically create, you know, rudimentary instruments right here in the program. So let me go into Sonics over here. Okay. Yeah. So there's the um, score, the keyboard. That was the other screen. <laughs> uh. So you gotta have a keyboard, and the instruments. So that's the default instrument there. So you can see it, it has a kind of a, a, um, a long lasting delay here. So if I play around with these. And then you can play with this. There's, you can create instrument, you know, your own instruments, and then once it says on name, so when you're done, you would save it. Oh, here we go. We get the predefined ones. Let's try. Um, it's a triangle. Should sound different. Should. <laughs> yeah, that's a synth sound. Yeah, yeah it sounds the same. Can you turn up the volume a little bit on your speakers, oh, there we go. Uh, Mark? Thank you. Ah. So that that sounds different. I got it to sound different. Hey. Well, that's a song <laughs> up here. Um, so this one, although wait, you know what? Um, oh here, I've got to play a different song here. Oh, this is instruments, sorry. Let's go to score. Load. This comes with some cool songs, huh. although if you're going to put this on YouTube, I can't play. Oh, that's true. <laughs> so I'll, I'll play the one <laughs> YouTube, that they made. YouTube will uh, talk about copyright infringement. <laughs> this one's impressive. So you can see it's got you know two, it doesn't have multiple. Uh, well, actually, you've got two. Uh, ranges here and then you've got you can do two more. So you can have quite a bit of sounds playing at the same time. And you can set the key here. Uh, and you can see lots of instrument changes happening up here. Hmm. And um, but they're all going out through what one of these one of the four sound channels. So when I hit play. Nice. Now while that's playing
you can just see what's playing and you can edit them too. Mm. So if I turn, it turns blue, you could be changing it while it's playing it. Oh. So I want to figure out like which one's the melody. Let's do this. Let's play again. So that's probably that one. So what's that? Is it one? I think it's four. That's the drums. Okay, that's the one I want. So if I go back here. I'm trying to find the, the which one is playing the, the main melody. <laughs> it's quiet for a while. Three? Oh, we'll take that one. We'll do three. That's easy. Okay, so let's go to where that tune begins. Looks like it might be that S. So here, if I do this, I think I have to go to instruments. Load and we load up a MIDI instrument. Let's see there, MIDI patch. MIDI patch. Huh. And we'll leave it on channel one. And we go back to score. And the little trumpet here. There. Yeah, MIDI. So I was playing on the keyboards, you couldn't hear it very well. But it's a simple idea. So you override, you know, you can choose whether an instrument is a built-in sample or going to a MIDI channel. Let's see what else do I have here. Um, with all for Sonics, yes. So this isn't, it's not using the set, that set chip in this case, it's a, just using like a, the standard audio output hardware. Yeah, right? yeah. But you, but you, you can, I'm, I'm trying to uh, compare with my old, my, uh, you know, 8-bit Mac, homemade, <laughs> like, yeah. did well, that the, 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 um, in it, a, a digital analog converter, and then, um, so well, you could send samples <laughs> to it. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the Amiga sound chip is, is more sample based. The yeah. waveforms in this program are just all, all done in software. Okay, so that's that is software. It's creating it's a just, sample from it's a, just you know. using the out, audio output yeah. raw. Yeah. yeah. I see. Interesting. All right. Let me go to. Uh, right. You can generate the sample. Right. Well, that's what I. You know, on the pet, I also have generatable sample. Mm. Even, like, yeah, it's not as fancy. But <laughs> And you know what, before that, but you can also draw in that sample. Yeah, I did, yeah. yeah. Instrument, and you can create your own uh, wavefront. Uh, yeah. yeah, oops. How to play with that thing. Oh, yeah? Yeah, when I was young. Yeah. Did it, it was fun? Made it fun? Well, you know, was made my first uh, music program. Oh, I bet. Draw. Draw. The way the mouse is sampling, it's like I'm not getting every dot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The more I do, I'll get more dots. Okay, anyway. All right, let's okay. go to uh, another so, one here. Wait a minute. After you drew on the screen, and then you could play what you drew on the screen? Yeah. It's not... Uh, okay. That's what I did with them before. It's easier if you... Um, right, let me try another... If I go slow, it will um, <laughs> get more dots. I think I have to hit OK. It's a little different. Huh. Interesting. Oh, we got, oh I can change the phase. So it's kind of going. Oh. Hear it doing its little ringer? Uh huh. Very interesting. All right.
let's go to another tool here. Um, Music X. So I, I noticed Music X in some of the promotional videos that Commodore has done, and I, I knew of it as a tool. So Micro Illusions, um, they had made video games before, a fairy tale adventure. And so I guess they, they decided, hey, music is a big thing on the Amiga, let's make a music tool. <laughs> So they, they did, and when I looked up Micro Illusions, they were based in Granada Hills, another local company. Uh, they also made Photon Paint, which is a pretty good uh, uh, design program, very you know, hand mode drawing tool. Uh, so, and Music X is, is I would say, if you, not, instead of being like Sonics where it was fit half and half, Music X is definitely more about MIDI than the built-in sound. It supported built-in Amiga instruments, but it was really intended for a musician who had a real keyboard or a synthesizer device that they could mm. control. Um, in reading about Music X, the developer wrote a little story about how he came about bu building it and developing it. And um, he said that over the years, they would get customer support calls where when people were doing what you were asking before, like playing on the keyboard and recording it to Music X to, to then edit, it was missing notes quite a bit. Like they couldn't figure out why when I play, it's like eh, some of the notes just don't come through. And he did testing and testing over the years, reported it to Commodore. Commodore said, oh, we'll look into it. And he said that years later, the <laughs> Commodore came back and said, yeah, you know what? So in the Amiga, there are what are called timers that, that, that programs use to keep track of uh, when they should do things in a rapid basis, whether it's refreshing the screen or playing sounds or data. Um, and then there's also the serial device, too. And he said that the timers had a higher priority than the serial device. And the serial device didn't have a buffer. It had a one byte oh. buffer, <laughs> not really a buffer. Very small. So if when you were playing, the, the Amiga decided something else was more important, they would just <laughs> ignore that byte. <laughs> so that's what was happening. So in later release, I, guess, I don't know what version they changed it, but they, they adjusted the priority level so that it would lose less data. They couldn't fix the architecture, but they made it so that it was a lot more reliable. But the developer felt like, you know, when, once you have a program that doesn't work reliably, you know, people tend to think, think, oh, you know, I, maybe I should try to find something else, and I might have hurt the reputation of the uh, platform. But, you know, I knew a lot of people that did music and stuff like this, so. But it's interesting that, it, that eventually somebody found, found it. They, they took, took them long enough to figure it out. And it was solved in? In the OS. In by the just OS. adjusting the priority levels of the timers the versus the OS. serial device. Yeah. You couldn't do that from a user program. I don't think, yeah. Yeah, interrupts. It's yeah. All interrupts. Yeah, it was all interrupts, yeah. Yeah. Which yeah, they occur and they're preempted and they you know, the OS decides. <laughs> and yeah, with a with a with a serial port with critical One. data, you can't <laughs> you can't miss it. You need to have a mode or yeah. Um I mean the, the the original intention was to prevent the system from being crashed by applications that were either written correctly or abusing how much interrupt they were using. So this kind of worked through, it kind of backfired. So with Music X, they, he wanted to have the screen look very colorful and have different um, colors for each section. You know how Sonics had like the keyboard and the sequencer, and, and, the, and so in Music X, each screen has a different color scheme. Mm. Um, another side note is that um, they demoed Music X on the show Computer Chronicles, and he said he forgot to bring, or, or something that was broken with his uh, keyboard's power supply. So he jury-rigged the wires in the keyboard itself to get power to the keyboard. And he carefully hid it so that you couldn't see it when he was doing his demo. <laughs> so there's the, the sequencer. Um, there's a, that's their keyboard view. You stick up the keyboard, your keyboard on the left there. Um, and then let me go into that one. So you know it works. <laughs> so I know less about this than any of the other programs. I can load a song. So remember how um, I mentioned uh, Micro Illusions, they made uh, Fairy Tale. So one of the samples here, uh, VH1, performances, Fairy Tale, there we go. So we, this one project, has multiple songs in it, so I guess that's how they organize it in Music X. So the first introduction here, if I hit play. It's changing the instrument, or did I change that? <laughs> there we go. The 
I don't know. <laughs> So you can see it right out of the box, it's playing through MIDI. It's designed for MIDI hmm. by default. And then you can add Amiga sounds if you need to. So I wonder if I go to other screens. There's Amiga sounds. Librarian, that's the tool that you were talking about, that Jim was talking about. You had a program called a librarian that keeps track of your samples. program. <laughs> oh, there's a guru. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't be, wouldn't be a demo yeah. without a guru. Right. Yeah. Next one I'll talk about is bars and pipes. Another one I don't know incredibly a lot about because at the time, you know, I didn't do MIDI composition. I was trying to do everything that could play on an Amiga. Partly because, you know, a lot of stuff that I worked on had to be played live on an Amiga. It wasn't, um, I couldn't give, you know, I couldn't assume they had a keyboard with them. So I had to design it that way. Mm. Uh, the real musicians would record stuff on tape or videotape and you know, be part of a performance. But I wanted to play it off of the computer. These programs, when they came out, they were very expensive. Yes, yeah. Oh. They were not cheap at all. I forget yeah, so the pricing. What, what? Music X was like $189. Oh! Well, they, the developer mentioned that, the, that they came out with the Music X Junior at one point to try to make a cheap version of it. Yeah, they were expensive. Right, so, life is the same thing. Hmm. Bars and Pipes it was another one that was probably most well known in the Amiga community as the you know cool the innovative software interface for doing musical composition and, and uh, arrangement. Um, it came out in 1990, so you know Amiga had been out for a while by then. And um, what, one interesting fact is the company was bought by Microsoft, and the I don't know if the code, but like the, co the concept behind the way it did music was built into Direct Sound. Windows. And that's part of uh, Microsoft now. Mm -hmm. So it had a very colorful, colorful interface too. And it, it, the name Bars and Pipes came from the fact that they kind of replicate re like plumbing almost. You have little, little uh -huh. like nozzles, and you have you know 16 MIDI channels, and you'd say, all right, I want to have this music going through channel one, and it's going to go out to this instrument, and this. So you kind of build this little like flow diagram of how your song's going to play. <laughs> Else on that note. Okay, so let's go to music, to um, bars and pipes. One thing I remember about bars and pipes, I don't know a lot about it, but I knew because it worked very close with what MIDI is, MIDI has a concept of, of not just notes, but time. So, kind of parallel to what's playing in your music, there's a clock constantly counting. So that other instruments, so, you know, if you have more than one keyboard and a drum machine and other thing, they all know what time it is. So if they're, if they miss a beat or whatever, they can jump to their part in the score that matches where everybody else is without having to uh, restart. And one of the things you could do is you could synchronize, you know, between bars and pipes and a toaster or other devices that oh. they kind of work with timing to create like a choreographed production. So let's uh, do this uh, song here. I might not be able to do this if I don't remember. This works. Work. Uh, music apps. So, look at that loaded. So you, I'm not sure. I guess there's a way to zoom into each of these tracks. They're all assigned instruments. Let's see if it's Timing, synchronization to MIDI clock. 
I mean, I think there were even dedicated devices that all they were was a MIDI clock. You just put it, you daisy chain all your MIDI devices together, and the MIDI clock kind of gives the master timing to everything that's happening. All right. Last on our list here, on our, on our tour. So we're, we're going from the earliest deluxe music all the way up to, you know, the most modern-ish <laughs> applications for music. Um, and that's ProTracker. So ProTracker was originally developed by a musician, and it was called SoundTracker. And um, it wasn't, you know, I guess they were not, they were a musician, but not a programmer. So they were able to create a basic interface where your four tracks are just notation by letters without the musical notations artistically. Um, and over time, different people took different takes on the same application. So, you know, SoundTracker became ProTracker. ProTracker, there was a spinoff that became Octomed. And there's Octomed Sound Studio. And there's different versions. Every version of ProTracker looks completely different. <laughs> um, but a lot of like uh, game developers and early electronic musicians who are famous now got their start with ProTracker. Because hmm. it was really easy to work with samples and it kind of let you work very fluidly with the keyboard. It had a lot of keyboard shortcuts for what you were doing in the different areas so you can adjust things. It had a whole lot of, I don't say limitations, but I mean, it was all based on the way the hardware could do things. Um, but you, then you learned all these cool tricks to work around the limitations, you know, that, that you know, we only have four voices, or that you only have so much memory on a stock Amiga 500. If you're booting this from a floppy, you have to put your instruments on another floppy. Um, and you have to make sure your instrument files are very small. Or you come up with tricks where maybe you put two instruments in, in the same file, and you can then go into the ProTracker settings and say, all right, when I want to play instrument one, play this part of the sample, and if it's instrument two, play that part, and play it faster or slower, you can kind of uh, reuse the same data over and over again to get different sound effects. Uh, and because they were split up, I mean, the left and right audio channels, one thing you would do is maybe copy the same note to both sides to make it stereo, but then you might, if you offset the second note by like a millisecond, it creates a what sounds like true stereo. It's not really, it's just giving you the illusion of stereo. But it, you know, there's a lot of neat stuff you can do. Uh, this is ProTracker, I think 2.3F. Um, it has, you know, the, the, you can see the scope there. It's always fun to watch when you're playing stuff. You can see the sound samples playing in those four boxes. Um, you had tools to like change the, the pitch and frequency of your notes. Uh, some of them had a sound editing tool. So you could, once you bring in a sample, you say, oh, well, there's like a pop at the end. Every time it loops, it goes pop. So you can cut that off. Can I ask you a question? Please? Yep. How do you quit the program? Every Good time problem. I open it up, I yeah. could never figure out how to quit it. <laughs> top left. The top I mean, left, the yes. Left. It's an invisible <laughs> button in the top left. <laughs> That's just it, huh? Yeah. They figured there's, you know, they've already got too many buttons on the screen already, yeah, so quit button. <laughs> uh, so let me fire up uh, one version of, of ProTracker. Most of these are written for PAL, so my screen is redrawing in PAL mode. Yeah, so if I click right up here in the corner, quit. Huh. I won't quit right yet. All right, now I've got to find the sample of the one I want to play. Uh, so these programs, it, it, it's like, it's almost a, uh, a game just figuring out how they work. <laughs> <laughs> like, how do I load something? There's no load button, there's no menu, drop down. You can find the sample button. editor, you can draw it. Huh? If, give it like 100 bytes of length, then you draw it and you can have a sample. 100 bytes? Instead of loading an instrument, you can go in the sample editor. You give like a length of the size, like 150 bytes, and then yep. you draw on that, and you can have a sample. Oh, cool. Kind of like, is that similar to what we were doing with, um, yeah, so with Sonics? Yeah. Oh, I, mm. I think there is a free draw for the. All right, let me go, let me go to, um, so you got to go to disk op, disk operations. If you want sample, yeah, there should be a lot of sample. But I'm not going to load a song, a module. Oh, a lot more. So it defaults to ST00, I don't have that drive, so I'm going to get rid of that, put in my DH1, without the outside there, there. And then I want to find uh, modules, mods, mods, all right, where is it? Uh, maybe it's in my 
examples folder. There it is, space debris. So you can load and play mods in this? Yeah, this is for making and playing mods. Wow. That's what's for yeah, the, yeah, the, the, pro the main file format for ProTracker is uh, mod files. Uh, let's see how we get back to the main. Yeah. Oh, the sound. Let's go to. There we go. Get back to the notes. Um, so there's a song that I remember from back in the 90s <laughs> that was called Space Debris. And I looked up, the, the guy who wrote it wrote a little story about how he came about making this. And he said, you know, I didn't have a full musical background, but I wanted to make something that sounded cool, had great sound. So he sampled instruments from his um, synthesizers. I forget what he said he had. I think he had a Roland and a drum machine. So that, like, right there, you, if you get good sound instruments, that, that's the first good part to making good music. You know, if, if you have bad instruments, it'll kind of detract from everything. Then he figured out what melodies he wanted to have, um, what, because this kind of goes through a couple different melodies. And then um, he pulled out all the tricks about how to be efficient on like, getting the most amount of sound out of the least amount of storage, like memory storage. Um, so I'll, I'll hit play. You can kind of see which, you'll see the little, there we go, like the little volume levels, which, which voice it's using to play what. In the main gray area here is a code that represents the note and I think the, the volume and then other, a command that you can do to apply a special effect to the note. Speed. So there it slowed down at the end because it was waiting for a long draw out right after loss. So this is also using um, software samples. Like yeah, this is all software samples. Now different versions of this program ProTracker did have MIDI support. But it, like, the main intention was to make mod files, so mod really didn't really, it, it was all based on sample files. Um, yeah, let me show you one other version of this. Let me show you how different they looked. Different developers had different takes on things. Uh, go here, let's go to ProTracker 362. There we go. Oh, looks different. Wow. It's Different. still a pro tracker. It's uh, running off the bottom of my screen. But yeah, you've got the tracks. You know, the layout's a little different where, where the buttons are. Disk operations is the same. Main menu. You know, at least it has a close button. <laughs> 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 but just to give you an idea of like how different these programs were from each other. But they're all based on the same concept and they all work with the same mod file format generally. Uh, there's one other one I wanted to show. So, in your opinion, are the newer Pro Trackers, the newer versions, better than the older versions? Uh, I think it's a personal preference. Oh. Do I have it here? Maybe I don't even have it. Huh. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Sound Studio. Another one. Different look and feel. Now, this one, Sound Studio, I believe, it, there you go. So, it's got a whole menu, menu for MIDI. So you can do the same things we did in Deluxe Music, you can do here too. So there you go, that's the whole evolution. And this has a, the, uh, the new you know, 2.0 or 3.0 style user interface too. Question, uh, yeah. how, how long uh, could the 
samples be, uh, as far as you know, in numbers, number of sample uh, or length in, in time, at least? Do you have any? Because I compared with like uh, six milliseconds, which is all I got from the <laughs> Millisecond. Uh, you, you can definitely do seconds. Okay, let yeah, me bring so up, the uh, samples can be quite large. It, yeah, well, relatively speaking, everything's relative. You know, I mean, even on, on an Amiga, like when a lot of people that, that did the composition early in the early days of ProTracker, they were probably on either a stock or just basically a great, like a one megabyte A500. So they, or, or 512K even. But here, if I, let, me, let me take a look at one here, if I go to. That, some more virtual, they were adding on that, for which the size was not fixed, and so you have like 100 k sample, and uh, in modern tracking, it's like everything, but you have to be more virtual, there was not too much. That's okay. Yes, it makes sense. That's because the hardware can handle that. Well, the maximum that you show it is 2 megahertz. Ah, it's in a poor number, because the media gets through, and the media gets through, and the media gets through. Mm. Where you keep the beat and where the CPU gets the memory from the audio, then there is the fast one. There the we go, there's different audio. samples. So everything that is in cheap, you can use the sound. So it's like 7K? And 4 or 5 hours. Oh, 15K? Okay, so there's 35. Intermediate version with 1 megabyte. 4K? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, when the pet is only 32K <laughs> yeah, yeah. here. Yeah, yeah, you're in a different ballpark. <laughs> or eight, actually, in, in my case, it was 8K original, and of course the sample has to be really tiny. But in your size, that's what you look at. I think the cheap uh, room is the best approach because you don't want to do it. Yeah. And then it goes away. The chip. Right. Well, it's, yeah. you're still using the memory for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or for the, for the sample. Yeah, but actually, yeah. Oh, you're volume. You're talking about <laughs> Using uh, instead of using sample, generate uh, the note of the, uh, the way. Yeah, but that's the simple thing. Well, if you don't have RAM, that's what you don't have. But I'll show you actually. <laughs> can, I, uh, can I get everybody over there so I can take a group picture, please, from the article? Yep. Oh. Uh, yeah, I think we're pretty much wrapped up here. Okay, uh, any other questions for Mark? Anybody? Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Any other questions? Okay. No? Okay, thank you, Mark. Yay! Yay. The Commodore Los Angeles Super Show.